Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, sorry, to verse 24. And I read. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not Till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I want to speak for a little bit this morning on the subject, the birth of Jesus Christ. Straight from the text, the birth of Jesus Christ. Father, bless your word to our hearts today. We ask again for your help. May your Holy Spirit take these few words and challenge us afresh concerning the Christmas story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Christmas, the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus Christ. Notice it says in verse 18, no, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. In other words, this is how it happened. And we need to know how it happened because there, there are so many stories going around today that are um, not correct concerning the birth of Christ. I was talking to my wife not long ago, and it hit me. Um, people call Santa Claus a lot around this time. But I didn't think about it because she speaks Spanish. Um, and I said to her, and I don't know Spanish, but then I, I, at least I know that Santa in Spanish is holy. Am I correct? Nobody's corrected me, so I'll assume that I know Spanish. <laughs> Santa is holy. Claus. So every time you say Santa Claus, you're saying holy Claus. And there ain't anything holy about that. You know, the very first attribute of God that he desires to communicate to us is his holiness. His separateness from sin. His absolute purity. His beauty. As a matter of fact, there is beauty in holiness. So the Bible says to us as believers, be ye holy. I, the Lord your God, I'm holy. Before we talk about his power and his glory and his creation, he wants us to understand a little bit about his holiness. A lot, I should say a lot. Because my friend, if God is not holy, then all his works are not holy. And if God is not holy, then his spirit is not holy. And if God is not holy, then his son is not holy. So we need to be careful who we attach the word holy to. I'll try my best not to say Santa Claus anymore. Oh, sorry. He's not holy, folks. But the enemy desires to replace the holy the holy God, Jesus Christ, with 
a counterfeit. Oh, you say it's just tradition. We just give the kids a little fun. And I guarantee you, my friend, Jesus wants us to know the story of Christmas. And the story of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It was not, it does not, and it does not, and never will ever include Santa Claus. I've made a few enemies right now. I know that's okay. But let's find out how the birth of Jesus Christ, how it was. Because the Bible tells me, and I'm so glad the scripture gives me an account of his birth. It says, now, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It means this is how it happened. It says, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together. So as you know, in the Jewish tradition, espousal or what we call engagement today was stronger than what we know engagement to be. Espousals was, espousal was, they were married technically. But they would not have yet come together in the sexual union of marriage or consummation of the marriage. But the engagement or the espousal was as strong, as powerful as a marriage itself. That's why Joseph was considering a possible divorce. Because technically in the Jewish culture, they were considered married. She was his wife. But they had not yet gone to bed together, so to speak, and have the, the normal, natural conjugation of the marriage. So Mary was a pure virgin. She was not, in that sense, she didn't have any sexual relationship. But she was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, the Bible says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So the first thing I wanted to note about the birth of Jesus Christ or how it happened, this is how it happened. Number one, the birth of Jesus Christ was divine. It was a miraculous thing. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. It was a divine act of God where he implanted the body of Jesus Christ in the womb of a virgin. Do you know most people don't believe that today? They say, oh, that's just a story. That somebody made up to make Christmas have something, you know, some kind of content to Christmas? Of course not, my friend. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It was divine. It was a, it was a miracle of God. It was a miracle that never happened before and never will be repeated. Where a virgin was, so to speak, the, the, the baby was implanted in the womb of a virgin. Only God could do that. So he bypasses the human blood stream from Adam so that the body of Jesus Christ would be sinless and his blood would be sinless. You see, when we begin to talk about his birth, you got to immediately connect it to his death. Because, you know, we spend a lot of time in Christmas time talking about this birth of Jesus Christ. And it is important to get it straight because if you have his birth wrong, his death is invaluable. And you're still in your sins. Okay? So Jesus says, this is how I was born. This is how I came into this world as a man. It was divine. Matthew 1.18. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The spirit, the spirit of God came upon her and planted in her womb the baby, the body of Jesus. Remember, and I have to keep emphasizing this. I know I'm preaching to the choir because this is Calvary Baptist Church and you guys know the doctrine. But you need to understand that doctrine has a practical side. Because there's a certain doctrine of the scripture, it means there ought to be a certain kind of behavior as, we, as a result of that doctrine. So I know you know that. I know you are quite aware of that. That life begins at conception. But when the baby was planted in the womb of Mary, that was not, and I repeat, that was not the beginning of Jesus. The Bible says, unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given. The son was not born. The son was given. God gave his only begotten son. 
And he gave Jesus Christ who existed in all eternity. So when, when, when we say the child was born, we're only referring to the humanity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was 100% man. And at the same time, 100% God. He's not God who became, who was lowered to the point of, of humanity. Neither he, was, neither he was he a man that was raised to the point of divinity. He's 100% God and 100% man in the body of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells me that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him and dwells in him bodily. That's an amazing thing, my friend. The body of Jesus Christ is the strongest thing in the universe. To hold the glory and the power and the holiness and the amazing majesty of God. So don't get it wrong. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It was divine. No human being had anything to do with that. The Holy Ghost of God came upon Mary. And she was a willing vessel as she submitted her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God used her womb to bring forth his son, the body, the baby Jesus. So his blood could be shed on Calvary for the sins of the world. But not only was the birth of Jesus Christ divine, the birth of Jesus Christ was disruptive. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Look at me quickly. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. You got to understand that birth of Jesus Christ was not only divine, but it was, it was disruptive. It was invasive. It involved real people with real emotions and real responses and real reputations and real fears. You see, we can't have a gloss over this. It's Christmas. There's Joseph and Mary in the stable and and we think these are some kind of superhumans. You got to understand what's, what's going through Joseph's mind. Do you know that not one time in the Bible we have anything that Joseph said? Not one time. But my friend, no greater character of honesty. No greater character of, of, of discipline and submission to the will of God is found in the New Testament. Here is Joseph. He's espoused to this beautiful virgin girl. Maybe 15, 16, 18 years old. We don't know. They were pretty quite young when that happened. And all of a sudden, he knows that he's okay. He's honest. He's never touched her. And she comes to him and says, I'm pregnant. Remember, this has never happened in the past. It's never going to happen again. And Mary comes to her spouse husband and says, I'm pregnant. Well, how did you get pregnant? The only way people get pregnant is if they have some kind of sexual relationship. That's what we know. Now, can you imagine what's going on in the mind of this, of this brother? I know some of you are thinking, oh, well, pastor, nowadays they have in vitro fertilization. Well, still it takes the seed of a man. Another male has to be involved. And Joseph is thinking, maybe, maybe she was unfaithful. Because it's, 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 it's not me for sure. Maybe Mary is not what I thought she was. Can you imagine the range of emotions going through that brother? And he's like, well, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a little heavy here, but I, I, I don't know how to deal with it. Um, really? As far as the Jewish law is concerned, if you commit adultery, because if she, if, she had, if she had sexual relationship then, it would be considered adultery. She had cheated on her husband. And the Jewish law states that she should be stained. We should take her life. We are talking about the Christmas story. It was on this wise. It was divinely orchestrated, yes. The Holy Ghost of God came upon Mary, but it was also very disruptive. He disrupted these people's wedding plans. It, it, it sort of a, took Joseph back for a minute because now he has to figure out how do I get out of this and not have Mary killed? How do I deal with the shame? Because how about my reputation? I mean, people's going to think that I, I'm the one who did it. 
but even if I could prove I'm not the one who did it, I mean, what about, what about this beautiful girl that I love? Can you think about what's going on to this brother's life? And he's not, we don't read anything he's saying. He's speaking to himself. He's saying, oh, he's minded to put her away privately and not make her a public example. That's how scrupulous Joseph was. He was like, I, I, I want to deal with this, but I, I still want to try to protect Mary. That's what you call true love. What a man. Ladies, you're looking for a husband? That's the kind of guy you're looking for. Loyalty. Even if he thought she messed up. He was going to give her the benefit of the doubt. And he's going to say, all right, I'll put you away. I'll end this wedding plan. I'll, 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 I'll shut this down. You can't imagine what's going on in Mary's life. Because she was perceived in the little town of Nazareth as a, a little pure virgin girl. And she's not messing up. She's engaged. And we know her husband is down in the carpenter shop. It was disruptive, invasive. And you think about the other lives that the, the Holy Ghost invaded. It certainly invaded Joseph's life and disrupted his thinking. So we kind of, oh, Christmas is cake and sorrow. Woo, glory to God. Are you enjoying this? But my friend, at the first Christmas, <laughs> the first Christmas season, it was not that easy for Joseph because God interrupted. Their lifestyle. My friend, God has a right to interrupt your lifestyle. And mine. We don't like them too much. When there is divine disruption. But the Christmas story was on this wise. It involves a miraculous divine act of God. But it also involved a disruptive act of God. We interrupted some wedding plans going through the sun. And my, life, my friend, the life of Jesus has always been disruptive in the lives of sinful men. And even godly people. Because God has a right to invade. He's God. And one day, praise the Lord, he's going to disrupt this earth's timetable. Amen? And he's going to disrupt your job one day. Yeah, yeah, he's going to disrupt your family life one day. And he's going to disrupt, disrupt your plans one day. Because God is in the business of intercepting and interrupting us to get us back on track. We were reading, we were reading this morning of the rich man, Jesus, the parable Jesus told of the guy whose barns, uh, his, whose field produced much. And he said, what shall I do? I will tear down these barns and build many bigger ones. And I'll say to my soul, 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 thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, be merry. Like some people are saying Christmas time, eat, drink, be merry. I'm seeing liquor stores open all over this country. And I'm wondering, are they celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ? One day, Jesus is going to disrupt this. He's going to interrupt your schedule. My schedule. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus interrupted that, that rich fool. The Bible calls him a rich fool. He said, I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much good later for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, this night, I'm disrupting you. This night, your soul shall be required of thee. I'm telling you, God's in the business of divine disruption. He will disrupt your plans. He will disrupt mine. He will, inter he, he, he will intervene. He will intercept. The Christmas story was one of those. And you could talk about other lives that he intercepted. The shepherds watching the sheep. And he interrupted them. The angelic host of heaven. The king is born. The wise men in the east, as they were studying the stars, he interrupted them with a star in the east. And they followed him and found King Jesus. 
this world. Have you paid attention to the divine interruptions in your life? It interrupts your emotions. It interrupts your plans. It interrupts your fears. Joseph was afraid. But the Bible said, fear not. He was concerned. He was struck. He was distraught. But I'm glad, my friend, when God interrupts, it's because he has a bigger plan than mine. Amen? Oh, if Mary and Joseph only knew that they would be eternally recorded in the word of God. And the, the honesty and the, the character of Joseph will be here forever on the pages of the book to remind me of what kind of man I ought to be. If Joseph only knew that when God interrupted him, it was not for destruction, but my friend, to elevate this man's character and to show the world what kind of man he was. We're talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. It was divine. It was disruptive. But it was also directional. Because the Bible tells me, while Joseph was thinking about putting Mary away, and putting Mary away privately, verse 20 says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead with the marriage. Again, watch me. Joseph had to walk around with a woman he had married yesterday. He had to walk around with her pregnant. Now today people don't think much about that stuff. But back in that culture, it was an absolute shame and disgrace. But Joseph was willing. When God interrupted his life, Joseph was willing to sacrifice his reputation, what people thought of him, for the sake of obedience. What a man. The angel said, fear not. Because this birth is directional. Look at it, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. Watch the direction. She shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. The angel said, Joseph, this is going somewhere. This baby that Mary will bring forth. You're going to call his name Jesus. Because Jesus will deliver his people from their sin. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It was divine. It was disruptive. It was directional. Get me? When we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, we need to move from the birth of Jesus Christ to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because the birth the birth was intentional. It was, it, it, was, it, was, it, was directing, it was directing Jesus Christ, my friend, straight to Calvary. He was born to die. If we, if we stay with the birth only, like, you know, the world likes to talk about his birth only. And I know it's season for us to talk about his birth. But his birth without his death will not produce salvation. We are saved because the one who was born in Bethlehem moved willingly to Calvary. And there, the body that he got in the womb of Mary, the body that God gave him, was hung upon Calvary. And his mother Mary stood there. And she, you know, most likely Joseph was already dead. But God intended for Joseph and Mary to raise this son, raise this boy. And there, as Mary stood and looked on the cross, the Bible says, Jesus looked down at her and he said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And he was telling John, the apostle who was standing there, 
to take care of Mary. As Mary watched him, the Bible says a sword is going to pierce through her heart. But you see, she remembered the little baby that she, that she gave birth to in a stable. And she saw him now hanging upon Calvary's cross, bleeding and dying for the sins of the world. My friend, his birth was directional. It takes us to the point where he would become the Lamb of God for, to, to take away the sin of the world. My question is, you, is, is to you this morning is this. Has the baby who was born in Bethlehem, the baby who was born on this wild, has he taken away your sins? Has he saved you yet? Have you, been, have, you been, have you trusted him as your savior? Because sadly, a lot of people who celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ will never spend eternity with him in heaven. Because they celebrated his birth, but never humbled themselves to his death and resurrection. His birth was directional. But also his birth was designed. Verse 22, 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. All this was done. In other words, the birth of Christ was on this wise and it was done this way. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The birth of Jesus Christ was designed. It was designed by God Almighty in the annals of eternity that a, a little baby would be born and his name would be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus Christ is God with us. God in our flesh. Apart from sin. And he became sin on the cross. Brothers and sisters, friends all, don't let this Christmas season go by without reflecting on the direction of the birth of Christ and the design of God for the birth of Christ. This was not just to give us something to talk about at the end of the year. And we know Christ was not born on the 25th of December. It's possible he was born somewhere earlier, either in October, uh, or, in October or earlier in or, or part of the, of the next year. And the Jews don't even celebrate the same month we do. They don't have the year. The calendar is not like us. Okay, Back then, their first month of the year is April. April 1st, first month of the first day of their year is April 1st. It's also the first day that Noah came from the ark. That's why I believe the world has gone ahead and tried to create all fools day on April 1st because the day that reminds us that the judgment of God was removed from the earth and God blessed the earth with the rainbow and all that. And, you know, and, and, and Noah came from the ark on the first day of, of the month. And so we, we don't celebrate. It's, the, the, the days of the year that are significant in the Bible are the days that the enemy tried to take and, 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 and you know, confuse. So the first of the Jewish year is April. April 1st. So we don't, we don't know. Most likely he was not born on the 25th of December. But what we celebrate is the fact that he was born. But he was born to die. There was a direction to his birth. Don't miss it, friend. Because the birth of Jesus Christ is described here for a purpose. And you say, Pastor, what can I learn from this? Well, I believe this. The birth of Jesus Christ, of course, was divine. It was disruptive. It was directional. But it was, there was a design to this. There was a prophecy concerning his birth. And it was fulfilled just as the Bible says 700 plus years prior. Which tells me that the Bible, the word of God, I can trust it. Whatever it says will come to pass. Look at verse 24. This is the message we get here. I believe this, these couple of verses can be used as a, an application. Verse 24. Remember. Divine. Disruptive. Invasive. People going through a range of emotions and fears and questions. But look what happens. As God spoke to Joseph and said, go ahead. You go ahead and take Mary to be your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And look what verse 24 says. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. And took unto him his wife. And knew her not till... She had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. 
He got up and he did exactly what God said. And he was even so careful that even as completely married people, he chose not to touch her. To remove any possible doubt as to the divinity of Jesus Christ. He obeyed. You say, Pastor, what is the lesson here in these last few verses? Here it is. Whenever there is a divine disruption in the direction of your life, trust and obey God to reveal his perfect design. What Joseph did was this. There was a disruption, a sort of invasion in his life, his family life. And God gave him a pretty heavy assignment. God said, Joseph, I want you to be the caretaker of my son. The father figure that he will be raised with. It will affect your reputation. It will affect the perception that people have of you. But Joseph, this is my assignment. This is what I've called you for. You Certainly, you're not the father. Because God is his father. But I want my son, my earthly, the child of God, the, 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 the son of God, I want him to be raised in a home with a mother and a father. And I'm giving you the responsibility, Joseph, to take care of little baby Jesus and little teenage Jesus. That's your assignment. Even if it means you may have to suffer. Ridicule, misunderstanding, but that's my assignment since I disrupted your life. What do I learn from the Christmas story? What do I learn from the birth of Jesus Christ as it was given on this wise? I learned this, that when God, when there is a divine disruption in the direction of my life, I need to trust and obey God. To reveal his perfect design. Christmas. I learned from the birth of Jesus Christ. That God. Would interrupt your life at some point. And God would interrupt my life at some point. But when he interrupts your life. This is not the time to curse him. Or complain. But to trust him. That he will reveal his perfect design. So Christmas. The birth of Christ. My question to you is this. Is it just a story in the Bible to you. That you're very familiar with. But have you learned something. From. The birth of Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate his birth this week, remember this. God is in the business of divine disruption. But anytime he does that, it's because he has a perfect design. A better design than mine. Joseph's design was I'll marry this little virgin girl. We'll have some children. I'll have my carpenter shop. We'll live, we'll die, and we'll look for something. Future. God says, no. I am going to invade your life with the birth of Jesus Christ. And through this, I will reveal to you my design for your life. There are people right now who have been convicted by God. The Spirit of God has convicted them. God has invaded their life with conviction. They know they need to be saved. They know that if they die without Christ, they're going to spend eternity in hell. They know that. 
God has intervened. Thank God for divine interruptions. God has invaded your life. God has moved upon your life saying, I want to disrupt this design that you have conjured up for yourself, thinking that you're okay. But sadly, my friend, many have rejected that. You know, Mary had to accept God's interruption, God's intervention. Because when God came to her and said, you shall have this child, she said, "What? Well, you know what she said? Be it unto me according to thy will. My question to you this, on Christmas Sunday, since God interrupted your life, either conviction or confirmation that you need to change your design, where you're going with your life, have you said to him, Lord, thy will be done and allow God to change the design, my friend, for his glory? Because I guarantee you, his design is always best. Always best. There are people in hell today because they have rejected the interruptions of God in their life. I can never forget the story somebody told me of that old that girl used to live in the 1960s. Uh, Marilyn Monroe. The evangelist, I think it was Billy Graham, who went to her probably two weeks before she died and said, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. He loves you. And in spite of your prolific, wicked life, God wants to save you. He loves you. He said, I don't want to have anything to do with you, Jesus. Two weeks later, I think, they found her dead in her apartment. Overdose of drugs. And although they may have an image around the world today, she's probably spinning in hell tonight. Listen to me, friend. God interrupts your life. To introduce his design. But he does not force you. We could talk about many others. I remember when God interrupted my life. On March 24th, 1982. He said, this is your time, Michael. The conviction of God was heavy. I could have turned and said, oh, I'll, I'll deal with this later. But thank God he allowed me to walk the altar and bow before to the Lord and say, God, please forgive me of my sins. Thank God he saved me then. I'm saying to you, my friend, has God interrupted your life? The, the Christmas story is about divine interruption. But it was an interruption to reveal God's design. And his design for you, if you're not saved, is that you're born again. That you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then he will change your life and make you like into the image of Jesus Christ. That is his design for you, my friend. But so many people are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ without allowing him to intervene. In their hearts and lives. Please, Christmas time. Why don't we submit to God's interruption? Because he has a design. If you're lost, his design is to save you. If you're saved, his design is to use you. To use you. And we'll be talking some more in the coming year about discipleship. So please, may God help you. If you're here today. To submit like Joseph. The Bible says, and Joseph got up and he did what the angel of the Lord had bidden him and he took unto him his wife. Are you going to obey God this morning? Mm -hmm.